everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach and this time I'm focusing on Unit 3, Question 5, which is an evaluative question. In this part of the paper, you're provided with an investigation that someone's carried out and a brief description of the method. Many of you have got the exam coming up in January and you need to be able to understand what the requirements are for each of the questions so that you can dedicate enough time on the paper to each question, making sure that you can get all the marks that you deserve for the overall grade. And what you're given is a brief description of the method, the data in the form of a table and or a graph and an overall conclusion. What you're asked to do in this question for eight marks is to evaluate the learner's investigation. So the person who's done the investigation, you have to evaluate what they've done. You have to make reference to the method, the result and the conclusion. And before you start on this question, it's really important to understand what the word evaluate means. So your aim really is to state the developmental points for the experiment that's in front of you on the paper. So how could it be made better? Um, how could it be made more accurate or more precise? It's really important to consider why you're suggesting those improvements as well. So for example, you can make an investigation more accurate if you um, have got uh, different trials, so you've got an average that you can calculate. But that's not enough just to say. You can then say, in terms of suggesting that as an improvement, you can say, well, you can help identify anomalous results. So it's really important to link what your improvement is to why that's an actual improvement. So the kind of questions I'd be asking myself when I'm looking through this particular part of the paper is, look at the conclusion. Do I agree with it? If not, why don't I agree with it? Has the data collection been appropriate? Is the method itself adequate? Is the equipment appropriate? Have they made a list of everything that I would need, for example, if I was to carry out the um, experiment myself? And it's really, really important before you start the actual um, answering the question is to make sure that you read the whole question before attempting the evaluation part. So from reading the examiner reports um, over the past few years, many, many examiners have found that the responses were unfinished. And that basically indicates that a large number of learners who do the exam run out of time during this question. It is the last question on the paper. So you can understand how they would leave it right to the end, obviously. But the exam is an hour and a half. And so I would recommend you spend at least half an hour on question four and five and you leave enough time to do so. So you'd have to make sure that you keep an eye on the clock in the exam so you can actually manage your time a little bit better. In true BioTeach London fashion, I've designed this video to walk you through some of the past exam questions. I think it's the best way to learn um, about the evaluation process and how to answer this question. So the first one I want to look at is the one from May 2018. Now, in this case, the experiment is designed to measure a current going through a role of conducting putty um, as the length of that putty is changed. And um, they cut that length of the putty in different um to different lengths, basically. So we're given the experiment set up. We're also given this kind of circuit set up um, that shows how they would set up the conducting putty cylinder. And the first thing that we're provided with is the method that the learner used. And so the first thing we have to do is read the method. And it says they would measure the length of the conducting putty cylinder. They would connect the conducting putty to the circuit, as shown in that diagram. They would also cut the conducting putty to a new length and they would measure the current for each new length of the conducting putty. So it's quite a brief method that they've kind of given. Now, when you initially read the question, you have to make notes on your paper about any relevant information from the stuff that they've given you. So in this particular example, you would make notes on the circuit diagram, such as the meters it contains, note the labels on the axes of the graph, which we'll look at in a second, and then start your evaluation part. So that's probably made a little bit easier. So if we just look at the method part of this particular experiment, um, I can kind of see that the setup looks fairly okay okay but there's a few things that I would be thinking about noting down so first of all the first part of the method says measure the length of the conducting putty cylinder what am I going to measure it with a ruler a meter rule do I need something with a millimeter measurement um you know what is it they've not specified that and um, the next thing is when we connect the putty it's got to be the same as well so the second point that I've written down in that box is that connection to the putty should be the same each time 
And the other thing is, is when we're passing the current through the circuit, it's got to be quite small. Otherwise, the temperature is going to increase and that's going to affect your end results. So you should also have like a switch to turn it on and off so that the readings are more accurate. And in the method, they should have said that it, between um, measurements, you should turn the switch on and off so that the results are more accurate. And then the last point I've kind of made is that the party should have a constant cross section. If it's slimmer in one part and a little bit chubby on another part, that will affect the current that's going through it because we know that the width of something can affect the current that's going through it. So that's really important to mention. If you look at the answers I've written down there, for each one, I've kind of said why you would do that. So for example, um, the switch turning on and off so that the results are more accurate. For the ruler, you could talk about accuracy as well, that you need to be more specific. So the results they gave in this particular experiment was looking at a graph. The results they've given on this paper is this graph. So there's no table, just one graph, and you've got the points that are plotted on. And when I look at this, I would be making some notes or annotations around the graph about any missing information, anything that struck me as a bit weird. So one of the first things that I see here is that there's no line of best fits. So I'd probably just write that down somewhere. The other thing that I notice is that at 10 centimetres, you can see that kind of point that doesn't quite follow the pattern. So that could be counted as an anomalous result. And obviously, they've not highlighted that. And also, I don't think they've done any repeats because it doesn't say the current is an average. It just says that the current, as you look on the y axis, it just says current in milliamps. And so I'd be thinking, OK, you've not quite done all the readings as repeats, you've also not tested between two and six. So I would be testing three, four and five as well. And I'd also maybe test 13 as well. So those are the types of things that I'd kind of look at and annotate. And then I'd put that down when I'm looking at the data part of the conclusion. So one of the first things I would notice as part of looking at this graph is that there is a negative correlation. I've already mentioned that there's no line of best fit and there's no evidence of repeat readings and that there is an anomalous result at 10 centimeters. So there's no repeat of that either. I can also say that the data is not spread evenly because there's gaps in the reading. So we would have to make sure that they took readings at three, four, five, and 13 centimeters. So you can see why it's important to look at the graph as a whole first and then write down your answer. Now, the conclusion that they gave on this experiment was to say that the current passing through the conducting putty cylinder decreases as the length of the cylinder decreases. So if I look at the graph and I look at the X and Y axes, what I'm finding is that the current is decreasing as the length is increasing. So the conclusion is incorrect. It says as the current passing through the conducting party cylinder decreases, the length of the cylinder decreases. No, that's not what happens. So the first thing I would say is the conclusion is incorrect. And then I would state what the correct conclusion is. So the conclusion would be that the current of the conducting party cylinder decreases as the length of the cylinder increases. The next question is from June 2019. In this case, the experiment is investigating the growth of cress from seed in different pH solutions. So they've given you a method over here, which is labeling five beakers, which pH values are five, six, seven, eight, and nine. You've got to place a piece of dry cotton wool into each of the beakers. You've got to place one cress seed onto the cotton wool in each of the beakers, and you've got to water it with a labeled pH value. Once grown, measure the height of the cress seedling in each solution. Fine. Looks pretty simple. I can already tell that there's quite a lot of information missing. So, for example, when I'm watering the crest seed, how much water am I meant to give it? How often am I meant to give that um, the water to the seed? I also don't know the volumes of the pH buffer that I'm using. And I don't I also don't know about the timing of growth. Like, does growth mean the sprouting and the germination or does that mean you know, 10 centimetres growth or five centimetres growth. So there's a lot of things that I could mention about the method here. So I've said, for example, there's no consideration of other factors affecting growth. So things like temperature, light intensity, how am I going to control those? They haven't mentioned that. I mentioned earlier about the volume of pH solution in the water not being given. How is it that I'm going to measure the seedlings accurately? Am I measuring with a ruler or any other device? In terms of the seedlings that they've used, are they all the same age? Because the condition and the age of these seedlings may affect the growth of that cress. 
I don't know how long it's grown for. Am I growing it for two days, a week, a month? Um, are the plants measured at the same time when I when I assess the measuring and how much they've grown? Are they measured at the same time? And am I going to have to water them daily? So there's quite a lot of errors in this particular method. And hopefully you've been able to identify at least three or four of these. So this particular investigation gave you a graph again, like a bar graph. And it, on the x axis, you had the pH of the solution, five, six, seven, eight and nine. And on the y axis, you had the height of the crest seedling. Again, just looking at the graph, I, I'm looking at it thinking, well, you haven't really tested anything in between pHs. So what about 5.5? What about 6.5? What about 7.5? Also, the pH is um, not just on the scale of 5 to 9. You've got 1 to 14. So perhaps we could test those because different seedlings might behave differently in different pHs. I can't really tell what the optimum pH would be from this. I mean, it looks like it could be 7, but equally... The optimum could be anywhere between six and eight, really. So the kind of things I'd be saying about this data, first of all, there's no evidence of repeats because there's no averages. I can't tell if the results are reliable because there's no repeats that have been taken. I also cannot tell if there is a significant difference in the growth between the pH as there's no statistical test that's been carried out. And also from the method, if you remember, they only used one seed on each of the cotton wools. So I would try and use more than one seed in case the quality of the seed isn't good and one doesn't grow. You can't tell then if it's down to the quality of the seed or if it's down to the actual pH not allowing the growth. Now, the conclusion on this particular experiment um, was that the crest seedlings must be grown in soil at pH 7. And one of the things that I was thinking when I looked at this is, well, you've grown it in cotton wool, you've not grown it in soil. So that's one thing that you could say about the conclusion. We also don't know that seven is the optimum pH. So I would say that you've only tested a small range of pH values. And so the values in between pH values have not been investigated. There's no identification of the optimal pH. And as the investigation is on cotton wool, what about soil? You can't say that the seedlings should be grown in soil at pH 7 because the soil might make a difference to the experimental results. So overall, I would say that the conclusion isn't valid and just make a point that the optimum could be anywhere between 6 and 7.5. You've not tested those. So you can't say that 7 is the optimum pH. So I... I've also trawled through some examiner reports regarding these investigations. And one of the things that the examiner report on this paper said is there was a lack of explanation of why the errors in the experiment were significant or how they might potentially affect the results. So only like the highest performing candidates gave any consideration to the factors that were seen um, that could affect this experiment. So for example, the amount, the dimensions, the arrangement of the cotton wool. So most learners focused on that, the size of the beakers, but they didn't really talk about why the variables had to be controlled, so they didn't get the marks. A significant number of learners were able to link the idea of using one seed to potential of anomalous results. That's why I've said on there, you should use a couple of seeds. Um, but many candidates, when they mentioned about that, they talked about the lack of growth at pH 8 and 9, um, and they didn't really talk about anomalies in terms of the seeds. The idea of the pH 1 to 14 was common, and it was lots of learners suggested that as an improvement, but lots of the better learners or the higher scoring learners identified that smaller intervals between pH values would give you a more reliable conclusion to be drawn from the results because that will allow you to identify an optimum pH. Soil was mentioned as part of the suitable replacement of the cotton wool, but you needed to test the idea of pH as well. So the last example I'm giving you is from January 2019. Now, in this particular one, the learner investigated the effect of temperature on the rate of diffusion and liquids. And they've given you a method over here where you needed to collect a beaker of water. You needed to add one drop of food coloring to the edge of the beaker. You needed to time when the color had spread throughout the whole beaker and you repeated it at different temperatures. Now, again, when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, well, this is quite generic. You've not told me, one, how I'm going to create those temperatures. You've not told me how much water I'm putting into the beaker, what volume of water. I'm adding one drop of food coloring to the edge of the beaker, but some of the food coloring might stick to the edge of the beaker and might not go into the water. And I'm measuring the spread of color throughout the whole beaker, but the spread of color is quite a subjective um, thing to observe. So that's not gonna give me very good results. So in terms of critiquing the method over here, I've just said, what's the volume of water in the beaker? That hasn't been specified. 
what volume of food coloring is that? That isn't consistent. One drop from one pipette might be bigger than another. The color's not standardized, so it's subjective. Um, as I mentioned earlier about the food coloring sticking to the side of the beaker, that could affect your results. How was the water heated to different temperatures? How am I measuring the temperatures as well? Like I'm going to need other equipment for this. So I don't, I'm going to need a thermometer. They've not mentioned that. They've not talked about the need for things like syringes, a water bath, a measuring cylinder, or even pipettes. So that's quite important to mention. The data for this was presented in this particular graph where you can see temperature against the time taken for color to spread. Now you can see that the temperature here ranges from 30 to 100. So I haven't got any data from zero to 30. I can also see that there's a downward trend, but what concerns me the most is that 100 degree temperature at the moment, because at 100 degrees, water boils. And so if I'm looking at diffusion, water's gonna be naturally bubbling at that point anyway. So if the water's moving around, then the spread of the color is gonna be down to the movement of the water molecules, not because of diffusion. So when I'm looking at the results over here, I would be talking about the boiling point of water first. Um, I also don't think the timing is precise on the stopwatch you know you have to time it appropriately and stuff and so they've measured it in minutes but ideally in any scientific investigation you want to measure it in seconds um the test was only carried out once so there's no evidence of repeats you need to take more readings at 40 70 and 80 degrees celsius because you've only really taken 30 50 60 and 100 so what about the temperatures in between there's no average that's been taken and the graph isn't a line of best fit they've done a point to point um, graph, but that's not ideal. And in terms of the conclusion, the learners concluded that the rate of diffusion of food coloring through the water increases with increasing temperature. So to some extent, I can I can appreciate that that conclusion is supported by the data from 30 to 100. But there's no evidence to support any temperatures below 30. Because I'm not necessarily happy about my data collection, I can't really say that the data supports the conclusion in that sense. So I hope that's been useful for you guys, kind of walking through some of the experiments and understanding what can be improved about them. I think one of the general trends that I see as a teacher is that they generally, for question five experiments, they haven't done any repeats. They haven't necessarily identified anomalous results. They haven't stated all the equipment that's needed. They're not necessarily stating specifically how long to time things for, the volumes of solutions and things like that. So as you practice more and more of these types of questions, you should be able to identify very easily what they could do to improve it. Please remember, it's really important to state why you're suggesting that as an improvement. So if you're saying they need to do repeats, say why. If you're saying they need to state um, more precise readings for timing, say why. So that's really important. You need to explain why that particular error in the experiment is going to create um, incorrect conclusions or inaccurate data. So that's all I have for you guys right now. Um, I think I've covered pretty much all of what you need for unit three, but if there's any questions, if there's anything else that you need from me, then please drop me a message underneath this video and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, good luck to all of you for your exam. I hope you do really well and please keep me updated as to how you get on. Bye for now.